the idea of a conspiracy theory is that there's something behind what's going on in the financial markets. There's something behind what's going on in the political world. There's something behind what's going on in the international scene. Have you noticed that a lot more people are believing in conspiracy theories today? Now you might ask, what is a conspiracy theory? According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, a, a conspiracy theory is a theory that explains an event or a set of circumstances as the result of a secret plot by usually powerful conspirators. In other words, what you see is not what reality is. The idea of a conspiracy theory is that there's something behind what's going on in the financial markets. There's something behind what's going on in the political world. There's something behind what's going on in the international scene. So we see with our eyes, we hear the news. We look at Fox News or CNN or ABC, NBC, CBS. We look at these various news sources. But the media is, according to the conspiracy theorists, is not really telling us the truth. There's something behind that. There's somebody that's controlling these great events. Now, it's interesting when you look at some of the ideas of these conspiracy theorists, some actually believe that the world is flat. They believe that uh, the idea of a round world is something that is a made-up theory, but the world is really flat. Others believe in what they call the hollow earth theory. In the hollow earth theory, there are holes at the poles of the earth, the north and south pole. And you can go down hundreds of miles, and uh, there are extraterrestrial beings that live in the hollow old hole of the earth. Now, some conspiracy theorists believe that there is life on Mars and that this extraterrestrial life is in a kind of a Star Wars battle to control the world. They believe that on Mars that there are tunnels and underground cities. One of the more interesting conspiracy theories is that in 1953, the United States government discovered, according to this theory, that there were extraterrestrials that were visiting the planet called Earth. And that in 1954, President Dwight Eisenhower met with what they would call the gray terrestrials. And as he met with them, he agreed that the United States wouldn't make war on them, try to destroy them. And he also agreed that we would uh, try to have a peace treaty with them, and it was called the Grenada Peace Treaty. They agreed that they would give to the United States advanced scientific knowledge and technology. You can look at uh, the conspiracy theories from a, a more recent time. For example, there are those that believe that the uh, assassination of President Kennedy was carried out by CIA, by the Illuminati, by the Jesuits, and there's conspiracy theories all around that death of Kennedy that it wasn't really carried out by Lee Harvey Oswald, but it was, there is some grand conspiracy, some attempt to control the world behind it. You can look, for example, at conspiracy theories relating to 9-11 where there are those that believe that it was the United States government that orchestrated that and that their understanding is that uh, it was done to make war in the Middle East to accomplish oil. That's kind of interesting because uh, there was no oil in Afghanistan where we went after on that basis. But uh, behind all conspiracy theories is the new world order idea. Now, in the idea of the New World Order, the idea is that eventually we are moving toward a world government controlled by a few. Now, there are two theories about this. One is that extraterrestrials will, vi will visit the Earth and ultimately take over. 
But that's not the main one. The main one is this, that there's a group of business people, a group of financial leaders, a group of bankers, a group of very powerful people that are currently meeting secretly to plan to take over the world. They will, according to this conspiracy theory, their families like the Windsors, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, um, they desire world domination and world control. When you look at these conspiracy theories, it leads to a question. And here's the question. Does the Bible teach anything about conspiracy theories? Does the Bible teach anything about one world government? Could it be that there is a satanic force that is con attempting to confuse mankind with certain conspiracy theories and miss the one conspiracy theories that is bringing the world together. For example, let's suppose that I'm giving you a math problem. And in that math problem, I'm giving you numbers. Add up these numbers, nine, six, three, and one. Now, how many right answers are there to that? Nine and six are what? 15, three, 18, one, 19. So nine, six, three, one, you get the right, the right answer, 19. How many wrong answers are to that? How many wrong numbers can you come up with in those four, nine, six, three, and one? If you come, for every one you come up with, I'll come up with another one, right? There's an infinite number of wrong answers. So in the Bible, when it comes to this whole idea of conspiracy theories, there is one divine truth but the devil doesn't care if he can confuse us with a variety of theories as long as we miss that which God has outlined in Scripture. So let's go to the Bible and let's look at what the Bible says about these conspiracy theories. We begin here in Revelation, the 12th chapter. And we're going to delve deeply in this study in the book of Revelation, look at conspiracy theories in the book of Revelation, so we can see where this world is headed. Revelation, we're looking there at Revelation chapter 12, and we're beginning with verse 7. There was war in heaven. That's a strange place for war, isn't it? There's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now notice clearly what the text says, that there's a battle in heaven. Satan and his angels fight against Christ and his angels. The Bible says earlier in this chapter 12 that the dragon's tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. You'll find that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. So one-third of the angels fell for Satan's lie. One-third of the angels fell for Satan's conspiracy. So the devil began a conspiracy in heaven. And what was that conspiracy? God's unfair. God's unjust. God gives us laws that we cannot keep. We need to be free. Free to express ourselves free to live as we desire. We need to cast off these restraints. God is a vindictive judge. He's a wrathful tyrant. He is not one that actually loves us. One third of the angels fell for that lie. They were cast out of heaven with Satan to earth. Now, did you notice what the two symbols of Satan that are given in Revelation 12? It says he is a serpent and a dragon. He's a serpent because he deceives and a dragon because he destroys. He deceives those whom he will destroy and destroys those whom he has deceived. And so here we find in Revelation 12, the first conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of Satan who has undermined the plan and purposes of God. It's a conspiracy of Satan. Now, what does the Bible say about Satan? John chapter 8, verse 44, in the Gospel of John, the Bible tells us, all conspiracies that are false are based on that which is untruth, falsehood, or lies. They're not based on facts or reality. John chapter 8, verse 44, you, you are of your father the devil, Jesus said, and the lust of your father you will do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of lies. So what we're dealing with is the father of lies. Is there a grand conspiracy in this world? There is. The devil, working through evil forces, attempts to control the minds of humanity, to form a large power block, a confederacy, to war against the people of God because the devil really desires to rule the universe. So we see a Star Wars controversy. We see a battle for the control of the universe. Isaiah the prophet sweeps the curtain aside in Isaiah the 14th chapter. Isaiah chapter 14, we're looking there at verse 12 and onward. Isaiah the 14th chapter, verse 12 and onward. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? Now notice the word Lucifer. It comes from two Latin words, lux ferro. Lux is light, ferro is bearer. So the devil is the light bearer. He stands the closest to the throne of God. He is one of the cherished angels of God, one of the prominent figures in, among the angelic beings. It says, how are you fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You... Uh, we're cut, you'll be cut down to the ground. You won't weaken the nations. Now notice, for you have said in your heart, so this conspiracy is developed in the heart of Lucifer. You said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'll sit upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the most high. First, he says, I'll exalt my throne. So there's a battle for the throne of the universe. The devil has this conspiracy where he's bringing together a confederation of business powers, financial powers, economic powers, political powers, governmental organizations, and religious powers. We will show that from the book of Revelation. And the devil is using his tricks to do that. He'll use spiritualism. He'll use false miracles. He'll use an attempt to get people to believe that this union is a religious union under the auspices of a political religious confederacy. So it's a battle for the throne. He says, I'll sit upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. What was the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north? It was what? Mount Sinai. And what do we know happened from Mount Sinai? The law was given. So what's the devil saying? I want to sit on the mount of congregation. I want to administer the law. Isaiah, the eighth chapter tells us about this great confederacy that's going to take place. And it says in Isaiah chapter 8, and we're, if you have your Bible, if you're taking notes, Isaiah 8, verse 11 and 12. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say not a confederacy to all them to whom the people shall say a confederacy, neither fear their fear nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts and let him be your fear. In other words, there's going to be a confederacy, a power block, an economic power block, a political power block, a religious power block. And in the auspices of religion, the devil will form this confederacy and his conspiracy is to bring this political union, this religious union, this economic union together. And notice what God says to us in verse 20 when he says... To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this world, there's word, there's no light in them. So what he's saying is, beware of these confederacies. Beware of this religious, economic, and political union. Now, does the Bible in the book of Revelation warn us against this union? And how can we be absolutely sure that we are not taken in by the seductive deceptions of Satan in this final conspiracy. Revelation chapter 17 tells us a little bit about this union. Revelation, the 17th chapter, describes this last day union. And you find it here in Revelation, the 17th chapter. Let your eyes, if you're following in the scripture, let your eyes drop down to verse 12 and onward. In the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings. They've received no kingdom as yet, but they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. 
So you have the 10 kings. 10 is a number that indicates completeness. It indicates one, a, a unity. And we had the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire. Rome was united, and that empire then was divided. So 10 kings represented this unity, this confederacy. It says, 10 horns, which you saw, 10 kings, they received no king, but they received power as kings one hour with the beast. The beast is a false religious power. If you've been following us on our YouTube channel, we have studied that before. Then it says, these have one mind and will give their power and strength to the beast. They will make war with the lamb. The lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Notice it says, these have one mind. So what's Revelation 17 saying? It is saying that the devil has a conspiracy. That conspiracy is to establish a confederacy. That confederacy is to bring together the kings of the earth, the political powers, and the religious powers to form this confederacy. Where do the economic powers fit into this? We find this in Revelation chapter 18. Revelation 18. And uh, we will notice it in Revelation, the 18th chapter, the third verse. For all nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication. Wine in the Bible is a symbol of false doctrine. Fornication is a symbol of an illicit union. So all nations drink of the wine of Babylon, false religions. They drink of the false doctrines that are established by the mother church that is drifted from the will of God. It's, they are intoxicated with the wine of false doctrine. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So you have the beast power, what is called Babylon, false religion. You have the kings of the earth, the political powers uniting with this false religion. And notice as we continue in verse 3, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So you have in this passage, political, religious, and economic power. They unite. What is going to lead to this union of political, religious, and economic powers? Catastrophe. As we look about the predictions of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus in Luke chapter 21, Jesus in Mark chapter 15, and uh, we see war, famine, flood, hurricane, tornado. We see natural disasters. We see political chaos. We see lawlessness. I mean, you talk about lawlessness in our society. Have you been following the news recently? See these smash and grab gangs smashing down stores, running into Best Buy, places like Best Buy, running into places like Nordstrom and high-end stores with crowbars, smashing jewelry counters, taking out jewelry, taking out TVs, grabbing clothing. The Bible says, iniquity shall abound. So what kind of a society should we expect before this great confederacy is formed? We should expect lawlessness in our society. We should expect shooting in our schools. We should expect a lack of safety in our society. Crime, robbery, murder. We should also expect natural disasters, hurricane, famine, fire, flood. We should also expect economic chaos. We should also expect international tension. We should expect the growth of nuclear weaponry and what will happen. In the middle of that crisis, through those catastrophes, there will be a political, religious union that takes place with the economic forces in an attempt to save society. What does the book of Revelation say ultimately will happen? Revelation, the 13th chapter. Revelation chapter 13, what ultimately is going to happen? Here, verse 15, Revelation 13. He had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So what are the issues? When this political, 
religious economic union forms with Satan's conspiracy to sit on the throne of the world and use this earth as a launching pad to take over the universe. So when that takes place, the devil then will use religious power, the mother church and Protestant churches, he'll use that in a time of crisis to bring the economic powers on this side and the political powers on this side together in this confederacy. Those that do not go along with the dictates, the commands, and the laws of this union will be subject to a time where they cannot buy or sell or subject to a time when ultimately they'll be threatened. Now, what is the issue? Revelation chapter 14 reveals what the issue is. Revelation 14. We begin with verse 6. This is God's last day message. It's a message to go to the entire world. It's a message to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. It says, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the middle of heaven. The angel does not float, he flies. Rapidly the angel goes out having the everlasting gospel. What is that? The everlasting gospel. It's the incredible good news that through Jesus your sins can be forgiven. Through Christ there is no condemnation in Jesus. Through Jesus, your guilt can be gone. Through Jesus, the grip of sin on you can be loosened. Through Jesus, the bonds that have held you can be unfettered. Through Christ, we can be free. Free from the guilt of sin, free from the grip of sin. Free from the penalty of a broken law and free from the dominion of sin in our life. This is the gospel. The gospel that transforms us. The gospel that changes us. The gospel that makes us over again. I saw another angel fly having the everlasting gospel to preach to them, to, one, to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people. This message is to leap across geographical boundaries. It's to span oceans. It's to go to every language group. Notice, saying with a loud voice, fear God, that's respect God. That's obey God. Give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Now notice, it's judgment hour. Now what is the final issue in this judgment hour? It's over worship. Worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. So the devil wants to sit on God's throne and in his satanic conspiracy, he longs for worship. And so he brings together at a time of unusual crisis. You see, what does the devil do? The devil stirs up natural disasters. The devil stirs up lawlessness. The devil stirs up pandemics. And then the devil gets some people to blame those things on God. But the devil uses those to bring together a coalition or confederacy. The devil uses those to establish his ultimate purpose of taking over God's throne and having worship. Now notice, worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. What is another name for the one that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters? What else do we call him? That's right, the creator. In fact, this phrase, worship him that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters, comes directly from the fourth commandment. What's the fourth commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So here is a call in Revelation 14, 7, to worship the Creator. Why is the Creator worthy of our worship? Because he fashioned us and made us. And so the Sabbath is a symbol that we did not evolve. The Sabbath is a symbol that we're not some speck of cosmic dust. The Sabbath is a symbol that God created us, that God fashioned us, that God made us. Now, where does the final conflict come to the focal point? Notice here, it has to be something about worship. So we go down to verse 9. There is a second angel. Babylon is fallen. That is all false religion that leads from the truth of God's word. Verse 9, the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, if anybody worships the beast. So you have worship the creator in verse 7. You have worship the beast in verse 9. Worship the creator is a call, an appeal to worship on the true Sabbath. Verse 9, worship the beast must be something opposite of the true Sabbath. Where does this find its fulfillment? Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So this whole issue 
of the throne of God, of Satan's conspiracy to try to rule the universe, is to try to deny the reality that God is the creator. Because one thing Satan cannot do is he cannot create. Satan cannot create life, only God can. And Satan is jealous of God, so Satan attacks the sign of God's creative authority, namely the Sabbath. How does he do that? He introduces a counterfeit Sabbath in its place, namely the sun god. So the Egyptians worshipped Amun-Ra, the sun god. The Babylonians worshipped Belmarduk, the sun god. The Persians worshipped Mithra, the sun god. The uh, Romans worship, adapted some Mithra worship, worship the sun god. And in the days of early Christianity, in the fourth century, when Constantine was trying to unite his empire, he passed a decree, 321 AD, where he said, on the venerable day of the sun, let the workshops be closed. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to try to bring his empire together. Church leaders united with him in subsequent church councils, like the Council of Laodicea, the church and state met together and formalized Sunday as a day of worship to unite pagans and Christians. Christians said, well, Christ is resurrected from the dead on Sunday. Pagans already were worshiping the sun god in opposition to the clear teaching of the Bible. Remember the Sabbath commandment written with God's own finger on tables of stone. Sunday became the common day of rest and worship. The devil is going to use that to try to bring the entire world under his fold at the time of the end. Now, there's a book that I have great confidence in. It's called The Great Controversy. It describes this. And on page 592 in the book Great Controversy, and I read, the dignitaries of church and state will unite to bribe, persuade, or compel all classes to honor the Sunday. The lack of divine authority will be supplied by oppressive enactments. Did we read that in the Bible about oppressive enactments? Did we read in Scripture about a time that nobody could buy or sell? Did we read in Scripture about a death decree? And of course, imprisonment will become before that. Now listen as I read. Political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth, and even in free America. Do we, do, do we see something about political corruption today? I mean, almost every news report that comes across, there's some political official, either in a local level, a state level, a national level, that has been involved in some kind of political corruption. So listen, political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. Even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Liberty of conscience, which has caused so great a sacrifice, will no longer be respected. In the soon coming conflict, we'll see exemplified the prophet's words. The dragon, Satan, is angry with the woman. This is Revelation 12, 17. When to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So notice what it says. Legislators yield to the popular demand. So the Bible does not teach that a single world ruler will arise and enforce decrees. No. It teaches that at a time of political crisis, economic crisis, at a time of natural disasters, that there will be a popular demand. And that popular demand will put pressure on legislators to sign in law a decree that will bring the world together. So there, this pressure will come from political leaders, yes, economic leaders and religious leaders, on the legislators to pass that particular decree. So this is the great conspiracy that's taking place now. What will enable us to understand where we're headed and how to stand through it? First, knowing God's word. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus invites you to fill your mind with the word of God. Fill your mind with the truths of scripture. Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The second thing is knowing Christ. Having a personal relationship with the living Christ. On your knees saying, Lord, 
I want to live in the center of your will. Lord, there's nothing more important to me than knowing you and living for you. Lord, my life is totally yours, knowing the word, knowing Christ. And lastly, knowing this, the time that we live in. Knowing that the signs of the times are being fulfilled around us and understanding those last day events. What did Jesus say through the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4? He said this, these things have I written to you. Let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. How can we avoid being deceived? How can we avoid being taken in by this political, economic, and religious union? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are children of the light and children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. So Jesus says, keep your mind filled with God's word. Know the Bible. Know Christ. And Jesus says, know the times that we're living in. Understand how Bible prophecy is currently being fulfilled and recognize that this world is in the hands of God. Disease will not have the last word, Christ will. Disaster will not have the last word, Christ will. Satan will not have the last word, Christ will. The evil forces of this world trying to bring things together in this economic unity and political and religious unity won't have the last word, Jesus will. Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Pandemics, let not your heart be troubled. Economic disasters, let not your heart be troubled. Political crises, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Satan talks about taking over God's throne, about uniting in this great conspiracy, political, religious, and economic forces, about a kingdom on earth. But Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. I am coming. Lightning flashes from the east to the west. The earth shakes. The skies illuminate with the glory of God. Christ descends down the cart of the sky to take his children home. The righteous dead are resurrected. The righteous living are caught up in the sky to meet him. And we ascend with Christ forever and ever and ever. In Christ's word, you can be secure. In Christ's love, you can be secure. In the promise of Christ's return, you can be secure. In the name of Jesus, we can be victors over the devil. Through the power of the living Christ, we can live with him forever and ever and ever. Is that your desire? Do you long to live with him forever as we bow our heads to pray? Why not right now say, Jesus, I want my mind filled with your word. I want my heart one with your heart, Jesus. And I want to cling to your promise that you're coming again soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much to, that you've exposed the conspiracy of the devil a master confederacy of religious, economic, and political powers. And Father, I pray thee that you keep us faithful to you until the day you come again. Help the words of Christ burn in our heart. Let not your heart be troubled. Thank you for the peace that comes from knowing that this world is in your hands and that one day we can live with you forever. In Christ's name, amen.